Well, hello. It's another beautiful, wonderful day. And as a good friend of mine says often, it's a good day to have a really good day. And here you are. You've arrived at the leadership series on the newly arranged show here on the Dr. Deb Carlin YouTube channel. And it's called Peace of Mind. Because more than ever, I see globally and in the United States of America, everyone, including me, and even if you are a leader, we are all looking for ways to be loyal and reliable and credible for our followers and for our fellow leaders. And we are all in search of the most important thing in life, peace of mind. And my guest today is a very special guy, and his name is Steve Eppner. And I am going to bring him in right now from the waiting room, <laughs> the green room, so to speak. And here it comes. Well, hello there, Steve Eppner. Hello there. Deb, you are looking great today, and yes. I love your furry friend. <laughs> we have we have our 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 team mascot with us here, Lady Hazel, who is attending to a safe chewy on the floor and making sure that our our whereabouts are protected and happy with a good vibe. <laughs> duper duper. So I, how how are you today, and what can we talk about? So I'm doing fine and looking forward to this conversation with you. I was just in the introduction before I brought you on, was talking to our audience about the ways in which this is called, this is a new series on the Dr. Deb Carlin YouTube channel, which has had a number of titles as we go through the themes, you know, from the K factor about kindness and then broadcasts about boosting your immune system and being healthy and and dealing with stress as we went through the last several years. And, and it, in this point in time, I am looking at our leadership in the country, our important leaders. And it's not just leaders of industry. It's not just leaders of companies, of, of schools. It is also leaders in the domestic sphere, in, in the within the home and also within neighborhoods, within communities in very small but significant ways. And the one thing that we all need to do is be so credible as leaders for the people who are following us. And in order to be a credible leader, it, 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 it demands many components, right? And the one that really right now is severely needed is peace of mind, right? Absolutely. You know, we, we all have so much stress and so many things going on that we need to be able to have an anchor somewhere. We need somehow to be able to know which way is north and be able to keep going in the right direction. And sometimes that's very difficult. Yeah, it really is. It, it is. it is stunning, really, how difficult it is. And one of the reasons why I wanted to, to bring you over and talk to you about this topic is you and I have known each other for a number of years. And our original meeting, I was introduced to the Steve Eppner. And I thought, whoa, this is great. I was and still am presiding over a not-for-profit that is in St. Louis, Missouri, the Missouri Venture Forum. And when I met you, I thought, well, Steve Eppner has done so much. You've been out in uh, the corporate world. You have stepped back from that. You've been in the academic world and your your skillfulness, your br your brilliance, your genius, your insight, your experiences. I wanted to grab hold of you and immediately invite, invite you onto what is a very small board of advisors and and with no disappointment, but all the time with great um reception to what it is that you're doing and what you're talking about and what you're teaching me. So if you would share, share with me your thoughts about what it is, is your mission 
in your life and your career as a leader well, to do? So it's, it's interesting because uh, I'm ADD. So I've flunked retirement four times now. Uh, and I keep trying, but it's just not taking. And I believe that I owe the community a real debt. Uh, I know a lot of people think that the lone entrepreneur gets out there and wins. Uh, it really does take a village or however you want to say it. And I have been helped by so many people along the way that I feel at this stage of my life, I want to help back. I'm going to give back. I want to help as many people as I can to sort of pay it forward. Matter of fact, when I help someone, my main fee is that they have to agree to help at least four other people during the rest of their lives without pay. And it's all a matter of getting people to help each other. I think that's one of the greatest things in leadership is understanding that you can do things like that and you can share things. I mean, I, I joke with my students, you know, we learn from our mistakes. Yeah. Sometimes I wish I wouldn't learn so much. <laughs> so my goal is to tell people about the mistakes I've made so they don't have to make them. And I think that's a big thing in leadership. I think a lot of people I've met along the way are absolutely terrified to admit that they ever made a mistake. Oh. Folks, you can't get very far if you don't make mistakes. Exactly. And, you know, when you're in a position of authority, which unfortunately people think sometimes, well, that person is a leader because they're a boss. Not necessarily. They may have authority, but it doesn't mean anybody necessarily wants to follow them, right? Absolutely. You're only a leader if you have followers. But when when you say that you you want to do the give back and you and you want to help people, um, you're talking so much about servant leadership, which is such a beautiful model because we are here to serve if we are leading or if we have an idea and we're we're wanting to have people grab onto it and become our followers. So when when you're when you're working with people and you're trying to help them understand that, what are some of the other things that you you're needing to teach them so that they understand that you know failure for one is a really big wonderful part of your leadership. Share with your with your followers that you are vulnerable, that you're not perfect. You know that they're gonna they're gonna succeed, they're gonna fail. So that, that you're humanized for them, right? Because sometimes leaders are put up on pedestals, which then you're destined to fall off of. So what well, are some of the other components? So there are a couple of things in what you just said. Many people want a leader on a pedestal because they don't want to make their own decisions. Mm. And you have to be very careful because that leads to cults, that leads to all kinds of problems. I think it's important that your team know that you're willing to make final decisions, mm -hmm. but that you're open to new information and new ideas. As a matter of fact, and, and I teach in the Graduate School of Business at St. Louis University. And one of the requirements I give my students in order to get an A for the semester, they must number one, challenge one thing that I say during the semester. Well, this terrifies students, even though they're graduates, because they've always been taught, you know, the professor's right, the book is right. I can't say you're wrong. And I'm saying, absolutely. I am one person. I have my opinions. And they are not absolute. So number one, you must challenge me. Number two, you must challenge the book. Because again, we read books to get other people's opinions, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily right or wrong. And you as an individual need to develop the mentality and the capability of being a good reader and being willing to question. And if you don't question me, you can't get an A. If you don't question the book, you can't get an A. And sometimes I say some really far out things, especially early on to get somebody to challenge me and say, hey, that ain't right. Yeah. And it's sometimes hard to get people to do that. And, you know, isn't it interesting in today's culture over the last few years, people who do have a lot to say, who are, by the way, you're sparking people's critical thinking skills, right? <clears throat> Contingency thinking and 
if this, then that, and how can I maneuver this? So healthy for intellectual development and, and great mind exercises. But in today's culture, there's been so many threats, no matter what side of the political fence you're on or the social fence you're on. Uh, don't you dare speak up. You'll get canceled. You'll get ousted. You'll be rejected. And so people are really um, tamped down or they're rising up angry. So what do you do? I mean, how do you get those students to do that? What I mean, I understand you're, you're going you're gonna to inflate it a little bit to get them to say, wait a second. But what do you do to get them sincerely thinking and being able to come up with sincere challenges so that they can practice it when they're out in the world? Well, and this is where, you know, we'll do role playing, um, which is really critical. And I tell them, you know, the first one up, I say, look, I really appreciate you taking the chance because I'm going to be your worst nightmare. And I'm not trying to embarrass you in front of the class, but I'm trying to give you and the class an example of what happens in the real world. Yeah. And I need you to react to that. And as you react to that, we're going to discuss your reaction, what to do with it. And that will inform you on things you can do in the future. So that's number one. Okay. Um, Number two, if I may, I think a lot of times when you get into conversations with people, and I'm going to try not to do this myself, but I feel like they show up and throw up. They got to tell you everything they know, and they try and make it as complex as possible so that you are impressed right. with what they know and where they're going. And and I practice the KISS principle, and, and I'll tell you what. There's nothing stupid about KISS. So I yeah. define KISS as keep it short and simple. I love that. And, and it's important because that makes it easier for other people to understand what you're trying to tell them and where you're trying to take them. So matter of fact, if I may, I'll make an offer to you and all of your readers. Okay. I, my last book is called Simplify Everything. Oh, Get your okay. team from do-do to done-done. Okay. Fabulous. And I will send you both Kindle and PDF versions electronically. And anybody who would like a free copy, if they'll just write you, <clears throat> feel free to send them one. And I hope they'll enjoy reading it. Oh, that's fabulous. That is absolutely fabulous. Thank you for that. And I'm just, I'm thinking to myself, we could probably on our YouTube channel, create some sort of a link of some sort so that people can do that. You can be notified so that we can have some engagement with it. You know, it, it is, it, it really is amazing when people come in and they just unload everything. It, it takes so much time that sometimes by the time that they're done with that rant, there's no more time for an exchange. Correct. And, and I, correct. yeah, and I think sometimes too, people get nervous about the interaction. And so they don't even have a mindfulness about, oh, this is a conversation. We need to, we need to take turns. You do well, you think? It's even more important than that. So I come from a technical background. Yeah. And I have my bachelor's degrees in computer science. My master's is in industrial technology. So I was what they used to call a tech weenie. And we would get into meetings and people would be spewing all this technical jargon because that sort of was what made our group sort of its own little group. Yeah. And I fought that. I fought that. Matter of fact, my first company's name was the user group okay. because I felt the end user was the most important part of a computer system, not the technical people. Now, we had to change the name by the early 90s. People were calling us about drug rehabilitation. So a different kind of user. So, so it was time to change the company's name. But the, the, the basic understanding was the same. Don't worry about the technology. Worry about what people are going to do with it. Yeah. It's the same with AI today. I just had a conversation with somebody and they want to tell me all the detailed technical background and mumbo jumbo about AI. And all I want to know is, but how are you going to use that to help me? And that's one thing that you have to do, whether you are in politics or in business, how are you going to help your end users, the community that you want to serve? And that's the most important thing. 
You know, I think actually this is really interesting. I think that this ties into everything that we're talking about here. When I was an undergraduate <laughs> 40 plus years ago. I've already had my 50th reunion. So Isn't it amazing? It's just oh. amazing. So when when I was in um various various reading groups and and uh uh scholarly exploration groups and in one of them we were studying quantum mechanics and talking about reading and reading the dancing Wu Li masters. Good and then, oh yeah, it was fabulous. And now people talk about quantum mechanics and quantum physics as though it's somehow, you know, brand new. No, it's ancient, actually. And, and same with artificial intelligence. And we didn't call it IA 40 plus years ago. We were calling it artificial intelligence and describing the ways in which we are collecting all this data, all this information. You know, it used to be before computers, you'd go to the library and go into the stacks, into the abstracts, which were paper copies, cataloging everything that we now do on a Google search, right? And when we were talking about artificial intelligence, there wasn't a fear factor associated with it. It was about efficiency. Because as we become a smaller world with greater communication, how do we encapsulate everything and, and, and pull the best from it? What it is we're actually targeting. Now, Google does that in a way, you know, or any of the search engines do that in a way. But I think that the way that leadership has released the information about AI, first of all, they should just say artificial intelligence and define it. People have gotten frightened. Oh, no, robots are taking over. You know, and then we see on various channels on social media, the high level um, technology implementation of clerks in like uh, Japan being robotic and they look and move like human beings and people get nervous. And, and there's, there's not the approach that you're describing of effective leadership, delivering the, the product and the service and saying, here's how this is of service to you. And I think you also have to be a little careful because I think we should be nervous about AI. If you think about what happened in uh, even the elections, uh, knowing that AI programs were out in the middle of our social network and creating this tribalism that's pulled our country apart today. I mean, because you start to understand what somebody likes and then you amplify that, you echo it, and then you re-amplify it and they are no longer capable of looking at what else is going on in the world. So I think I wouldn't just say that, hey, AI is going to be great. AI has a lot of potential negatives. And I think as leaders, we need to recognize that and we need to build uh, some gates around it to keep ourselves safe and to recognize when other people are using it improperly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we even have programs now at the university that will read somebody's paper and determine on a percentage scale whether this was created by AI or by the person themselves. Okay, people are cheating and they're getting used to it and they're thinking, well, no big deal. Everybody does it. Well, everybody doesn't do it. And if you are going to advance in this world, you better be able to think and write and talk for yourself. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. But you know, the whole presentation and orientation in introduction to it, I take back the word orientation, the whole introduction of it though, has been on um, sort of a, a Star Wars level and with, with uh, enthusiasm and then with fear, without anything that's in between. Do you think that that's a trend in our culture right now that that people, the fear factor is alive and- I think it's them? more that people don't like nuances. So they want black and white, there's good and bad, there's left and right, there's up and down, and there's no in between. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's creating an issue with anywhere from 40, 50, 60% of the population they don't want to know anything different. 
you know, when I when I talk to management groups, I, I often tell people, you know, the only person who likes change is a wet baby. And so one of our jobs is we have to make people feel wet. And yet some people are so far to one side or another, they, they can't feel wet. They know exactly what they want to know, and they don't want anything else to break through that comfort feeling. And I think that's our problem. People have closed their minds off. And somehow as leaders, we've got to help them open their minds and be willing to think about new things. And how do we do that? Because people get into their comfort zone, right? And they sit there and then they think, well, I have peace of mind. It is, it is everything fits, everything's in its place. And, and I don't have to worry about any intervening variables or any contingencies here. So how do we get people off of that and into that exploration and that, that acceptance of new and different movement? Well, first of all, I think there's some base, and I've heard numbers like 30%. You're never, ever going to be able to move those people. Those are the people who want to join cults. They don't want to know what else is out there. They want somebody to tell them what's right, what's wrong, what time to get up, what time to go to bed, what jobs they take in their commune or wherever they are. Um, that's all they want. They, they want to feel that comfort. And so there's 30, 35% of our population. Once they find the cult that they want to be part of, forget it. You are not going to be able to break them of that habit. Uh, it's it's like cocaine. They are into it. They are addicted to it. They won't let it go. So the other part, it's somehow you got to get people to open their eyes and show them that there are other things out there. And how do you do that? Sometimes it's just by luck. Sometimes it's by circumstances. You know, how many people are saying, hey, there's no climate change, but all of a sudden we're having horrible hurricanes, horrible fires. We had the hottest summer on record. And they're saying, well, maybe there is a climate change. And what I tell them <clears throat> to try and get a conversation started, I say, look, can we agree that the climate is changing and we can argue whether people are the ones that are causing the change? And That's then all of a sudden, strategy. you know what? You're right. The climate is changing. This is a natural occurrence. Okay. Yeah. We've had ice age and we've had hot age, right. but we agree that the climate is changing. We won't agree whether man caused it, but now if we agree that it's changing, are there things that we can do to minimize the changes or to make it easier to live with? That's how I try to open conversations. You know, I like that. And, you know, one of the things that, that I find myself doing and why I am so invested in peace of mind is because I kept feeling my own strong desire for it. <laughs> You know, over the last several years, there's been so many things that can unhinge us. And mm -hmm. and really, let's go back to when the first culprit ruined everything in terms of packaging by poisoning the Tylenol. And then all of a sudden we have these, you know, caps and seals that we can barely get into. And then things just tumble out from there and we can run through a long list of events. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that the busier the world gets, you know, the person who, you know, comes into the conversation and delivers everything, the people who act out and do these heinous crimes, there is a desire on the part of people to be recognized. Everybody wants to be recognized and heard and somehow valued. I mean, it's why the, the sitcom uh, Cheers, you know, was such a success where you want to go where everybody knows your name. Well, hopefully you want to go where everybody knows your name in a positive way for something really good. Um, but in, in a world where there's so much noise and people are trying to be recognized, I think everyone is looking for their grounding, their place, their peace of mind. So when, when I am trying to influence people's behaviors, their attitudes first, their perceptions, their attitudes so that they're open to the idea of behavioral shifts. I'm thinking of what is the vehicle of communication and, and really the feelings that go with it that'll get them to feel like, oh, 
I, I'm thinking I might have peace of mind there and maybe not consciously, but you know, this feels kind of comfortable. I want to keep moving in that direction. You know, I, I've got, and again, maybe it's because I'm ADD. I like to be uncomfortable. I like to go for something new. I like to challenge what I'm thinking. Um, I, I think, you know, I do a lot of volunteer work for the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. Yeah. Okay. I'm a, I'm a techie. I'm a computer guy. I know nothing about plants, but I had the opportunity to start learning, to challenge everything that I knew about how you grow things. And I, I love it. I've been working there now for about six years yeah. and it's all volunteer. I, I, I say I'm a paid volunteer. I pay them to let me volunteer, uh, but that's fine. Yeah. So there are some of us that just like finding the new. And yeah. I'm comfortable with that. The shame is, I don't think there are very many people that feel that way. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that when the world becomes so unpredictable and volatile, people are looking for their grounding. They're looking mm -hmm. for something that is the same, that allows them to feel like they're safe and they're, they are comfortable. I don't like being uncomfortable, but I do like what you describe. I just call it curiosity. Okay. I okay. like to be explorative and to find out new things and new neighborhoods and new foods and new people and all that. But these days with a tremendous and exponential amount more of caution. Well, because but, there's I mean, so much volatility. And, and I don't think that's brand new. I, I'm trying to think back, you know, when I went to college back in the Stone Age, I mean, we, we chiseled our notes in stone. But, you know, and, and the, I think the campus, it was such a big school. I think we had 13,000 students on campus, yeah. uh, which is nothing compared to today. But what happened is probably 80% of the students gravitated to sororities and fraternities so that you had that grounding. Yeah. You had a safe place. You had your brothers or your sisters. And it also gave you an identity. Very and nice. I think that, so it's it's not all that new. It's just different. Okay. But it's the same thing. Instead of joining a fraternity and going through Hell Week, you join a cult. And, and then you complain about everything that's happening in the world. But you found yourself a chamber where the echoes were were self enhancing and they made you feel good because everybody thought the way you did everybody dressed the way you did everybody wanted the same things that you wanted and part of it we need to break that down and i'm not sure how but i know we need to and this is where i was saying before i always look for some common ground and then try and build upon that because i know there's plenty of uncommon ground but how can we find something that we can all agree on and then build from there? You know, I think that that's one of the reasons I love this wonderful creature I've got here on the floor with me. I She is a two and a half year old standard poodle golden retriever. And I adopted her when she was just two years old and is a rescue. Not a good story, but the good story is that now she's mine and I'm hers. And, it, and I've, I've been training her, uh, which is something I do on the side, temperament testing and training dogs to be service animals, legitimately. You know, you can't bring me a peacock and say, well, this work. No, that's not yeah. going to work. N none of that. Dogs. And she is, first of all, she's beautiful and she's got a beautiful temperament and she is so happy. When I put her collar and her vest on her, she is standing at attention and she is ready to go to work because she's trained that way. Mm -hmm. And bringing her everywhere is that common thread of bringing people together. She is the quintessential icebreaker. When oh, I yeah. walk in, you know, it's it's nothing. I try I try for for my entrance to be something everywhere I go, you know, by saying hi to people and being friendly. But when I bring in this innocent creature with big eyes and long eyelashes, who looks like, as most people say, a Muppet, then it, it, it is a, it's a real gel. Even with people who 
I find myself recoiling from because they look like they might be really tough people. And when they immediately soften because it's an animal there. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. It, you know, it's kind of like the, the prison reform programs that we see where every prisoner gets a dog mm -hmm. and their job is to bond with that dog and habilitate it. I'm wondering, Steve, in our culture, you know, you've talked about um, with, with us privately outside of this, the different types of leaders, that a, a leader isn't just a one thing leader. But there's 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 certain characteristics and certain types, and some people are better than others, and some people shouldn't be a leader; they should be a something else. Can you speak to that? Because I think it I think it um, it's pertinent to what it is we're right in the middle of now. So one of the things I, I want to be a little careful because I teach this in conjunction with understanding business and business structure. Okay, but. Leaders, to me, are able to take the vision of whoever started the company, the vision of the company, and turn that into strategies. Mm. And then they sell people on following their leadership based on these strategies. But most leaders, not all, most leaders are not good at implementing strategy. That's where you need managers. Managers take strategy and convert that into tasks, into projects, into things that can be done. The managers then build teams of people who actually do the execution. I call those the doers. Okay. Doers like to do, and they love strong managers who will take care of all the politics and leave them alone to do things. Okay. The managers get things done through other people based on the strategy set by the leaders. So too often we have one person who is the leader, the manager, and the doer, and they don't want anybody else in their sandbox. Absolutely. I think we need to understand that there are multiple roles. In my own business, I, I was doing okay until I started to grow. Mm -hmm. And as I had more and more people in the business, I learned a very important lesson. I was not a manager. I had vision. I had strategies and I could do, and I could do very well, which is why we got more and more business. But until I was willing to hire a manager to take over the day-to-day, -day, I never reached my potential. Mm. Now, here's a hard thing for leaders to do. I had to swallow my ego. And I said to my managers, his first name was Jeff. I said, Jeff, you can hire or fire me on any project. You can't fire me from the company because I own it. Okay? <laughs> but yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis, I will follow your lead because I still like to consult. I still like to do the doing. But I had to tell the rest of the crew, look, I'm not a good manager. Hmm. I've got the vision. I got the strategy. Jeff is the manager. He's running the business. I think there's a lot of that that we do in life as well. We have to be careful. We have to know what the strategy is, but sometimes we may need help implementing that strategy and that's not a bad thing. Yeah, absolutely. So the the leader really in, in your um, thinking is the visionary. Well, no, there, there's a visionary first. So in, in starting any company, you have to have an overall vision or mission. Mm -hmm. But in order to make that mission a reality, and I'll use a military because this is pretty easy. I need a general who then takes the vision, says, that's the hill we got to take. And he's going to turn to the lieutenants and the sergeants, and they're going to put together a team of people who can execute a program to take the hill. So the leader is taking the vision and saying, this is where we've got to go to reach the vision. The manager is then converting that strategy into actual can-do tasks and projects. This is great because you just nailed what I think is a magic formula for peace of mind for all people listening to exactly that. Peace of mind comes with knowing who you are and mm -hmm. 
knowing what it is that you are good at doing and want to be doing. Absolutely. Fabulous. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. No, and it, it makes it easy once you are willing to admit where you belong. And now I have, before I started my own business, I, I worked for Union Carbide, Monsanto, and City Corp. And after I sold it, I got hired by Boeing to be their entrepreneur in residence. So I've I've had my own business, started with one person. By the time we merged, acquired, and I retired, we had about 200 people. Mm. But then Boeing had, you know, almost 200,000 people, actually 175,000 people when I was there. And one of the things that I learned very quickly is that egos in organizations can actually destroy them. But smart organizations in both Monsanto, which is now Bayer, and Boeing did this, they provided a career path for people who wanted to be super doers. And they were called fellows. And the fellows didn't have to take on management responsibilities or administrative responsibilities. They were allowed to be the go-to people who knew how to get things done that everybody could look up to. Now, they didn't have a lot of fellows, but the ones they did were just amazing. And they were comfortable because they didn't have to give up their skills, their research or whatever they were doing to become a manager to move forward. They were allowed to improve their skills and become better mentors and better instructors at bringing the rest of the organization along. So do you, do you think of yourself as a leader? I think of myself as somebody who has a vision for the future. And I think of myself as a really good doer. But when I get the right people yeah. and I can infuse them with what I'm thinking, they are able to convert my vision to strategy and action. And then I can be part of the action. And that's fun. Yeah, that is really fun. And do you think that because you know that about yourself, does do you have peace of mind? Very much so. Now, maybe it's because I inhale, but that's going back to the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> but it gives me peace of mind. I'm, I'm, I'm calm. I know where I am. I know who I am. I'm not jealous of people who've done much, much, much better than me because I've had a very wonderful life. You know, we have our ups and downs. We've Absolutely. all been, you know, through recessions and, you know, depressions and what have you. But for the most part, this has been good and I enjoy life for life. I think that when 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 people hear that and when they come to recognize I was thinking about this earlier this morning. I just, I felt somehow shaken and uncomfortable. And then I realized today is a memorial of a very significant event for the United States of America, 9-11. And, and I thought, you know, why am I so jittery? I mean, I, I, I'm not going to have a second cup of coffee. <laughs> this just feels wrong. <laughs> and, and I, and I did have the news on in the background. And of course, what are they doing on the news? It's all about this and as well, it should be, but um, it got me thinking the ways in which I am happy is intermittent with times when I am craving my happiness when I feel settled and when I am craving feeling settled. And I think it's that motion and that evolution in life that keeps us vibrant and growing and changing and exploring, which if I didn't have that, what would I do? I mean, I think that, well, I have had so many people ask me, mostly my contemporaries, my age, kids who I went to grade school with in high school, so Deb, you know, I, I, do, do you have retirement plans? Every day at about 7.30, I start looking forward to the retirement to the bed and I'll put in my hours and I'll get up tomorrow. No, no, really retirement. No, uh, you know, I, I am just getting started. But what do you mean? I really, I've got so much I want to accomplish. I think that there's so much to be done for people 
and for our society, I can't imagine doing what? Yeah. Who, you know, my friends that have totally retired and sit on a park bench have all gotten old. Yes. They look old. They act old. Yes. I don't want to join that. I, no, I, I like don't to either. Right. You know, now, I can't help feeling old sometimes. I mean, you know, my, my son just turned 50 and then, you know, I'm only 39. So it's really causing some dissonance up here. I, I can't figure out how this happens, but you know, it, you've got to be comfortable with where you are. Now you just said something a minute ago. I just want to bring this up again, because you talked about, you know, hearing on the news and they were talking about 9-11. If I could have anything happen, if I could create utopia, I would refuse to allow 24 hour news to be on any. Yes. I would, I would let Walter Cronkite do an evening wrap up and somebody else do a morning. What happened overnight? I think that's the worst echo chamber because they've got to make up news. Everything's a breaking story. Somebody spilled their soup. It's a breaking story. Yeah. A news I mean, alert. Give me a break. You know, if you watch the news for more than 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes at night, you are going to put yourself in a bad way. And yeah. I even did an experiment once. I, you know, there, there's the left news and the right news. And I've watched them both. And I found that if I spent about four hours on either one of them, I came away feeling mad about what was happening in the world. That's right. And they both are telling me something different is wrong about the exact same incident. Right. I agree a hundred percent. And I, and I, and I remember when the TV would go off, you yeah. know, it would end with the national anthem and then it was, and then, and then you had some pattern on there. Exactly. And I think that that was a really productive way to be. Um, okay. Well, you know, I think we have answered all the questions for the world <laughs> <laughs> and gotten ourselves into a beautiful space of peace of mind. And my hope is with every, and my intention, not just my hope, but my intention with every um, episode, we talk about all these different things in terms of leadership. And then we also drive it into the things that people can do to, in my theme, build the strength that they already have, their inner strength, bolster it, and get peace of mind because they really have genuine well-being. And it's all the if, things we've covered. If I can offer one suggestion to you, yeah. keep it simple. If you keep it short and simple, I think you will find more people will gravitate to it and will be able to do it successfully. All right. Well, I'll have to have you back so that you can remind me again and again. <laughs> Glad to do it. Well, Steve, thanks so much for being here today. And to our listening audience, I am going to say peace out and we wish you well and peace of mind and all good things. <laughs>